Now, even a week ago, it seemed unimaginable. But in just seven days, the Taliban have swept in to take control of a third of the provincial capitals in all parts of the country. Just a few hours ago, it was confirmed they had won back their former stronghold, Kandahar, Afghanistan's second city. They've also taken Herat in the west and claim to have detained the veteran militia leader Ishmael Khan there. He is one of the regional strongmen on whom the government is now relying. Aid agencies are reporting that a quarter of a million ordinary Afghans have been forced from their homes by the fighting and that many of them need food and shelter. The Taliban have made rapid gains since July. The red areas show where they had control then. Now look, and just a month later, more and more districts have fallen under their control, leaving the map looking like this. The question now, will the militants continue their lightning speed offensive towards the capital, Kabul? Here's our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. The war is closing in on Kabul. This is Logar province, a little way to the south. This morning, an ambushed army convoy, pictures filmed by Taliban fighters, which they say show captured government troops. The Taliban anxious to show themselves as unstoppable. And who's to say they're not? Two of the country's biggest cities, Herat and Kandahar, have fallen in the past 24 hours. The government seemingly incapable of stemming the tide. Kabul is now swamped with displaced people. There's no shelter. They're living out in the open. And the question in the capital, how soon before the Taliban come here? American officials say the government could fall in as little as 30 days. The Western withdrawal is almost over. After weeks of scenes like this, thousands of British and American troops are being sent in to finish the job, leaving Afghanistan to fend for itself. It is a, uh, a country led by warlords and led by different provinces and tribes, and you end up, if you're not very careful, in a civil war. And I think we are heading towards a civil war, uh, initially shown by a, a, a Taliban with momentum. More than 450 British soldiers died in Afghanistan. Each loss, with those of their comrades in Iraq, commemorated in the Wiltshire town of Wootton Bassett. Was it worth it? Sergeant Peter Rayner was killed in 2010, hit by an improvised explosive device while on patrol in Helmand province. My husband died to give them a better life. And by them not having a better life, it's taken away his fight. So I think this government needs to stand up and be accounted for, same as the American government, because they went in, they had plenty to say when they went in. Now what are they saying now, what's going on? Western troops went into Afghanistan to defeat Al-Qaeda and stayed for 20 years. After such a long time and so much blood and treasure, some of those who played a central role feel remorse. I had hoped that we would hear from the government an explanation for why we're in this position and then uh, an explanation of how they're going to avert this disaster. Uh, all we've heard is an admission of failure and, and a desire to pull people out. That seems to me, uh, you know, I'm almost ashamed that we're in this position. The West had hoped to leave Afghanistan with a stable government and an army able to stand on its own two feet. With the end now in sight, what will this long war's legacy really be? Paul Adams, BBC News. Our correspondent, Yugita Lamai, told us how people in Kabul are feeling about the Taliban's approach. The Taliban continue to make rapid advances in this country. Now they've taken a province which is very close to the city of Kabul. And there are real fears about the future of the capital of Afghanistan. Everything has changed here just in the span of a week, and it's taken people by disbelief. The second largest city, Kandahar, now controlled by the Taliban. Uh, it is a traditional stronghold of the group, so for them, it's a major victory. Herat in the west, close to the border with Iran, an important trading center, that too now controlled by the Taliban. These are major losses for the Afghan government. It leaves them in a very vulnerable position. And people here are really waiting to hear from the leadership of this country, from the president of the country, about how things are going to unfold in the days to come. 
Well, in a sign of their growing alarm, the US and Britain are sending troops back into Afghanistan to help evacuate their nationals. We can go live now to Washington. Our correspondent Gary O'Donoghue is there for us. Gary, welcome to you. Um, we understand that US troops have now started to arrive back in the country. What's the latest? Yeah, I mean, bear in mind the time scale for these 3,000 troops heading to uh, Karzai International Airport was pretty tight anyway, 24 to 48 hours starting yesterday. So not surprising that the first contingents are getting there. Bear in mind these troops are already in the kind of what they call the Central Command Theatre, that part of the world in the Middle East. So they didn't have far to go wherever they were deployed for, from in that region. So the first one's arriving already, the rest to arrive perhaps in the next 24 hours. And that process of evacuating US embassy staff can then begin. And I think the, the urgency, of course, been driven by the sheer pace of the Taliban uh, march across Afghanistan. Uh, and of course the prospect now, the real, the very real prospect that the Taliban could be in control of the country, could be in control of Kabul on that 20th anniversary of 9-11 next month. And what's the reaction been to events in Afghanistan over the past few days? Well, fairly muted. There's been some pretty strong criticism from Republicans this morning over Joe Biden, their, their view of Joe Biden's handling of the situation. Of course, the, the thing that led to this withdrawal was Donald Trump's agreement with the Taliban last year and the talks that began in Qatar and the, you know, the promise to withdraw American troops wasn't made by Joe Biden, although it was reinforced and brought forward by Joe Biden. But they're accusing him of being reckless and his policy leading to disaster. The administration, though, is standing pretty firm on this. It believes that it's up to the Afghan government to resist the Taliban, that they have the means to do that, that 300,000 troops have been trained, equipment has been donated, a trillion dollars worth, and they believe that there's it's divisions at the top of the Afghan regime that's stopping them resisting properly and indeed negotiating properly in those talks in Qatar. The UK Defence Secretary has said in the past few hours that he believes it was a mistake for the United States to pull out. Just what kind of an international reaction has there been to this and could it become a real headache for President Biden? I think the US administration is set on its course on this one. Their priority at the moment is the safety of their staff. The, the impetus to get troops home was incredibly strong after 20 years. I don't think that will make too much difference to their calculations here. They will continue, they say, to be engaged. They're not leaving the country in that sense, diplomatically, politically. And I think they will be putting as much effort as they can into these talks in Doha, where they believe some pressure can be brought to bear, not just from them, but from Russia and China and other regional powers. Uh, whether or not the Taliban is in any way susceptible to that kind of pressure, we'll have to see.